Hi everyone, uh, this is the return of, oh my goodness, Shh. cat almost knocked over the water glass, and now he's going to drink from it. Well, any rate, uh, this is the return of lecture number three, part two. We're going to uh, use Jupyter Notebooks to do a little bit of linear regression, and we're going to go at, do it two ways. First we're going to roll the uh, solution ourselves. Going to use the math that we looked at in the first section of this lecture and we're going to manually calculate the regression coefficients. All right. We're going to use NumPy, NumPy, NumPy. Choose your pronunciation. It's a standard tool in uh, Python for uh, scientific computing and numerical computing. It's very fast and it's optimized to do amazing stuff in uh, linear algebra land. Okay, <clears throat> without further ado, now that I no longer have a cattail on my face, let's head over here and maybe, uh, yeah, that looks a little bit better. Okay, so this Jupyter Notebook is also on Canvas for you to download, place in your Google Drive, and you can start it in Google Colab and be able to do all this stuff yourself. Gives you a little bit more uh, time maybe to understand things, to play around with things, you know, get you started on this whole idea of using uh, Python notebooks to get machine learning done. Okay, so Jupyter Notebooks are an environment, if you're not familiar, which enable you to execute code. Uh, you can actually do more than one language with Jupyter. You're not actually locked to Python. They provide an environment a little bit like the MATLAB command line if you're coming from that world. Just before we begin, one general caveat about notebooks. They're great for putting together programs, visualizations, writing, you can mix them up. You can essentially make reports. If you're a Mathematica user, this kind of thing is kind of second nature to you, right? Where you can make reports with programs and data in them. You can write with the data. Um, as a programming environment, they have some issues. It becomes easy to execute things out of order if you choose to do so. And that means that you can end up in cases where you don't know how to regenerate data. It can be, uh, you know, if you execute this cell and then this cell and then that one in the middle, you execute last, you can get yourself in a situation where you have created something that you don't know how to recreate the second time. So please be careful, um, especially as you're like, this is the kind of thing like as you're fiddling around and trying to make stuff work, a lot of people fall into this trap. Okay, so just if you haven't used Jupyter Notebooks before, you haven't experienced the, them, they are really, really great. And they can be diabolically evil when you get yourself in a trap like that. All right, regression. So uh, the first part of this, I just have some helper functions that we're going to use. These helper functions generate data. Okay, so let me tab on over here. So I'm just going to execute these helper functions. Uh, there's not much to say here, except that this is your first introduction to NumPy. This command, for instance, linearly tiles the space from zero to one with a, uh, this many points, okay, that are linearly uh, separated across that that basis from zero to one. Okay, so this here generates a normal random variable with this standard deviation and uh, generates a vector of the size of those random numbers. Okay, so obviously you can guess this is probably a sine wave and some other things generally become super obvious uh, after a little bit. If you have not used NumPy in the past, uh, there are several excellent tutorials out there, and I know that your TAs are going to talk a little bit about it during the discussion section. Okay, 
So we did, we've created these functions, all right? They're waiting for us to use now. So if we're gonna do some regression, we need some data. So I'm gonna generate some toy data using a linear function. There is a real linear function that we have defined, and that's represented by this graph's green line. It's the generating function. Now I'm going to then create some data from that function there are 10 data samples. They are the blue dots on that graph. The blue dots start from that green line, and then there's random noise added on top of that line. So this simulates a true underlying process that you want to feed into your regression, but it's corrupted by some noisy measurement. Okay. So this is our data. We will now use it to train a linear regression. But first, remember how we've talked about we need features, we need inputs, and we need those inputs in a format which are good for our, our algorithm we're going to apply. So uh, I have taken a function here from a library called scikit-learn. Now scikit-learn is something that actually we'll do, a, we're gonna look into a lot during the course of this quarter and it has a lot of tools for doing machine learning in it. So the polynomial features call, what it does is it takes an input and it generates a set of polynomials from that input. It generates the features. If you give it X, it will give you one plus X plus X squared plus X cubed, however many polynomial degrees you ask it to give you. All right, so let me show you what I mean here. So here we have, in this column, the, the second column of the matrix, we have 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, all the way up to 1. Those are the 10, those are the x values of these 10 blue dots on this graph just above, okay? So it's 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, so on and so forth. Those are the x values of those green of those blue dots. Over here on this column, you'll notice it's all ones. So why is that? Well, I told it to generate a degree one polynomial, and a degree one polynomial is one plus x. Why did I put the one in there? Well, remember that we are generating a line, y is equal to mx plus b. In this case, what I'm doing is I'm putting that b, that bias term, the intercept of the line, I'm putting that in the inputs themselves. Okay, so flashback to the lecture part one, where I showed you the data matrix, right? This is going to be our data matrix. It is the x inputs in column two and a bias term in column one. The bias term is included in the inputs in this case. Okay, so that's a, again, that's a um, one degree polynomial. Just to make sure you understand what's going to happen, what do you think will happen when I generate a second degree polynomial? What will you see? Did you like my freeze frame? Did you really think I'd cut away and frozen the frame? All right. Uh, so you should have, I hope, guessed that you would see three columns, the bias term, the X term, and that X, that second column squared in the third column, okay? So in this case, we have a second degree polynomial of all of the inputs available to fit for a linear algorithm. Okay. All right, what are we going to do here now? Well, we are going to actually solve for the parameters w, for the vector w, which holds the linear regression coefficients. And remember from the lecture just a second ago that the way we do this is we generate the pseudo-inverse 
of that design matrix. Okay, so the design matrix is this, right? It is the first degree polynomial because we're fitting a line. All right, that's the one we want. We'll clear the, uh, the current output right there. So we want this one just to focus in on it. We want that first degree polynomial uh, feature set. Okay, so we generate the pseudo inverse, which is the design matrix transpose times the design dot product that design matrix. Take the inverse, the matrix inverse of that, and then we dot product that with the transpose of the design matrix again, and then dot product with the target values, with the y values that we are fitting. Okay? So let's take a look at that in one go. All right? So we have here, again, we'll just generate this these uh these features again and call it x train this time design matrix train same thing we saw above but now i have a variable name attached to it okay and what we're going to do is make a bunch of numpy calls to do that pseudo inverse so let's take a look at how this works so here is x train that is our first uh element of the, the pseudo inverse. And we transpose it. Ah, you can see X transpose, right? Then we dot product it with the original design matrix. And note the nested um, parentheses here. So all of that runs through the numpy algorithm INV. And INV, as you might guess, is a matrix inverse. Okay, so we get that matrix inverse out, dot product it with the uh, transposed design matrix again, and dot product it with the Y train. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. And what we get out is the coefficients of the linear regression. The first coefficient is the bias term. That's the intercept of the line. Okay, the second coefficient is the slope of the line. It's the, it's the term applied to the x column, right? So the first, the first output of w is multiplied by the, the bias term column to generate a value. And the second term is multiplied by the x value to get the predicted y. Put, add those two together and you've got the y predicted. Okay, so let's compare. Um, 1.3 is the fitted value of the x of the, the y intercept of the bias term. The true underlying generating uh, function was 1.17. The fit value for the slope is 279. The real value of the slope was 3.14. Okay. So we're not right on the money. Why is that? Why did we not recover the exact underlying function? Because the data what? Yes, because the data are corrupted by noise, right? We only had 10 samples of the data so there's not a lot to kind of average out things and get rid of the noise by averaging it. And the data was corrupted by this noise process. So random chance, this is the best fit of the data. If we didn't have any noise corruption, we would exactly fit, right? Okay, so great, but maybe that just wasn't very clear. Maybe you need a little bit more review on the linear algebra and how dot products and transposes work. So I just want to break this down into those steps, okay? This is just that, you know, that solution of the pseudo inverse, we're going to go by it bit by bit to see how that W looks as it goes. So remember, here is the features, the 
design matrix, right? So what happens when we transpose the design matrix for those of you that you know, want to see how this goes? Well, instead of getting 10 rows and two columns, we get two rows and 10 columns. Everything turned on its side. Okay, what happens when you take that transpose and do the dot product with the original design matrix? Oh, interesting. You get a matrix which is square two by two. Why does that happen? Well, remember that the first uh, matrix in a dot product determines the number of rows. And the second matrix determines the number of columns. And in this case, they have matching rows and columns, and it's two. All right, so we get a two by two square matrix, which is super important because you can't calculate a matrix inverse if the matrix isn't square. All right, so the next step involves calculating that matrix inverse. And um, remember that the matrix times the matrix inverse equals what? That's right, the identity matrix. You guys are good. Okay, so, um, so the final step is just to take all that and we add two more dot, uh, uh, so dot products we do, we dot product with the, uh, the design matrix transpose first, which gets us to, oh, we end up back at a two rows and 10 columns because the first thing has two rows and the transposed version of the design matrix has 10 columns. And that's good that we have the 10 columns because we need those 10 columns to multiply across on the 10 <coughs> y values, the, the, you know, the, the y values of our toy data, the training labels that we want everything to actually be fitted from, okay? Remember that we generated way back up here these blue dots, right? And all that design matrix stuff, those X's have all been the X values of these dots. This part is the first time we've seen the Y values of these blue dots. These are the target predictions we would like our algorithm to fit. Okay, so that's the final part. And when you multiply uh, these through, we only get two elements in the W because we have the two rows here and y, the Y is 10 elements of a column vector, right? So that works out to be the two things, which again, we have 1.3 is the bias term and 2.79 is the slope. All right. Whew. Basically, that was really an excuse to give you a linear algebra review because there is no way you are ever going to actually do that when you need to fit a linear regression, right? You're gonna use a piece of software to do it for you, duh. There is indeed an easier way. Um, so Scikit-learn being a great machine learning library has a linear regression that you can use. I've imported it already. Here's the call to get one. And um, rather important, remember that we already put the bias term, we already put the intercept in our features, in our design matrix. So don't let sklearn fit another bias term because now we'll have two bias terms and I'll mess up everything. So we have to force it to not fit the intercept because we have given the intercept in the design matrix. Okay, so scikit-learn is a class-based library. Essentially, all the different machine learning algorithms that it implements all have a uniform interface. They all kind of look just like this when you use them. They all inherit uh, their behavior from a super class, okay? So uh, the nature of it is always we create an instance of the classifier we want to use. That's this call where we get our model. And then there's 
something like a call to fit to the method fit where we give it the x values of the training set and the y values of the training set the desired targets we want it to hit and then it's done the models fit we need to we can do whatever we want with it we can predict new stuff on the training set or we can take a look in this case at the coefficients of the linear regression and they look identical to what we hand calculated so that's good i guess we did the hand calculations right all right last thing to do um, i want to show you something a little wacky what if we tried to use not linear curve fitting not fitting a line what if we tried to fit a nonlinear equation to these same toy data, right? We can go ahead and keep that same toy data. And remember that we can generate polynomial features of whatever degree we want. So if you want to do nonlinear curve fitting, you want to fit not y equals mx plus b, but y is equal to x squared plus 2x plus 1, we can fit a parabola or anything onto this just by generating these features. Now wait, you said. I thought ordinary least squares was a linear uh, algorithm. Good question. You're paying attention. Yes. It's for doing things linearly with respect to the model parameters. The model parameters are linear here. We have a linear combination. If we do this for the squared, remember that way up here? Do, 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 where'd it go, where'd it go, where'd it go, right? We are trying to generate linear combinations of 1 and the x and the x squared term. So everything's linear with respect to the model parameters we're fitting. It's just nonlinear with respect to x. And this is what doing features instead of the input values gets you, right? If you just gave it the x term, you could only fit a line. But because we can give it polynomial versions of that x term as features, we can do something much more impressive. We can do nonlinear curve fits using a linear algorithm. So you may need to play with this yourself to try to understand that in deep. I'm just going to, I don't want to go too long on this video anyway. So just to show you, I have here used the same toy data to fit the linear regression right here. And you can see with polynomial of one, right? M equals one is the polynomial of the, the the features. So the green line, once again, is the true function which generated the randomly uh, noisy blue dots. Okay, The blue dots are randomly noisy versions of that green line. The red line is the linear regression fit. And you can see what we were talking about way up top there, that um, the coefficients are not exactly the generating function coefficients, but they're not terrible. Okay, what does it mean when we fit a polynomial degree zero? What do you think that is? Oh, you're right. We are fitting just a constant, right? Just a constant term. Do you happen to know what that constant term is that we fit? What's the value of that constant? You're right, it's the mean of the data set. It's the mean y value. See, somebody's thinking. Because that is the mean y value is what's going to minimize the error of the residuals here. Right? If you guess the mean of the distribution, you're the least wrong. Ah, okay, good stuff. So, but we can also fit third order or ninth order or anything we want to this data. And I want you to take a look at these red curve fits. Do they look like good predictions for you? I mean, 
Clearly not, right? So if we extrapolated beyond one here, if we tried to predict what would happen when we fed an x value of three in, uh, these are both gonna be terrible predictions, okay? So what you're seeing here is that a ninth order polynomial is way too complex for linear data. We are overfitting the data. The ninth order polynomial is so powerful, it actually basically has zero sum of squares error here, right? The difference between the blue dots and the line of fit is basically nothing. So it's fitting the data in the training set exactly, but it's gonna generalize like crap, okay? So don't worry if that isn't very clear to you because what I'm doing here is previewing some stuff we're gonna talk about in the next couple of lectures. All right, thank you very much. I hope this was fun for you and uh, feel free to play with this notebook on your own. Bye.